Today we will be in Luke chapter 11, reading verses 33 through 36. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see it. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. You may be seated. This morning, we're, we're looking at a passage that uh, steps into light and dark. Uh, two very big contrasts that Jesus is pointing out and, and asking us to pay attention to. And so before we just jump right in, I just want to stop for a second. I just want to give some space. I'm going to pray. I'd encourage you to pray as well, um, that God would meet you in this moment, that he would speak to you, that he'd open your eyes to what he wants you to see, um, and that the Spirit would convict where you need conviction and encourage where you need encouragement. And so let's just pray together now. Uh, Father, as we come before you, um, we know that you are the light of the world. And so we ask for you to shine brightly in these moments. Uh, Lord, if there's, there's any darkness in us, uh, God, that we are holding on to or hiding uh, or pretending's not there, uh, Lord, would we, would we bring it to you? Would you expose it in these moments? Uh, Lord, we ask your spirit uh, to search our hearts, to know us, uh, to convict us, but Lord, to also uh, illumine the way uh, for us where we feel discouraged this morning or confused, uh, where we feel lost or just tired, uh, would you meet us? We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Al Johnson is probably not a name you recognize, and I didn't know it until I heard the story of how he robbed a bank. Uh, and he and a couple other of his buddies uh, went into a Kansas City bank, robbed it kind of old school fashion, just put their guns up, and then got out of there as fast as they could. But on the way out, as they were leaving, uh, two of the guys went in one car together, and Al went his own way. The two other guys, as they were trying to make it to the getaway station, got in a car accident, and both were killed. Now, as, as tragic as that might sound, for Al, it actually worked in his favor because the police saw these two convicted felons that were now robbing another bank and said, we've got our guys, we're all good, this case is closed, which meant... Al had just gotten away with robbing a bank, and he had all the money and all the proceeds that he just got to use in how he saw fit. And he carried this secret with him for a really long time. And eventually, he would meet a good woman, uh, so good, in fact, that she loved Jesus, and he knew he was way out of his depth, and so he thought the only way to win her over was to pretend that he loved Jesus too. And so once you start lying, you find that it actually just gets a little bit easier to compound the lies. And so he got married, and they, they lived their life, and uh, the longer he stayed in the dark, the more his eyes began to adjust to the shadows. See, in this passage, Jesus is reminding us of what we take in our eyes, what we look at, what we pay attention to matters. Are we focusing on things of the dark or are we focusing on things of the light? Because what we consume will consume us. And so to be lights for his good, we must fix our eyes on the true light of the world. Now, the purpose of light is, is really simple. When we look around this room, we see lights all over the place. The purpose of light is to illuminate. It's to bring clarity. It's to bring uh, perception. It's the ability uh, to rightly see the world around us. But in the dark, our vision can become distorted, unclear, and at times unhinged by the imagination of our minds. As I was working on this, I was looking out one of our windows as the sun was setting and was just watching the shift of the woods as the, the, the light was fleeing and the darkness was coming. 
when it was light, I could see each tree individually. I could see all their leaves, their foliage, what was left. And it was, it was beautiful. But as it got darker, they just kind of started to become this mass of tangled objects that you could no longer see clearly. And to me, this is the danger of when we live in the dark, we don't see things as they truly are. And we begin to fill in the gaps and allow our imagination and our own perception to be what guides us. And so Jesus is fresh off a conversation. He's in the midst of, he's just healed a demon. He just cast it out of somebody. The people there that were all witness to this, they've got a lot of questions for him. And they're like, how are you doing this? We think you're doing this by the power of Satan. They're questioning who he is. And Jesus is just conversing back and forth with them. If you were with us last week, Pastor Ryan talked around this whole idea that Jesus was saying, listen, you've seen all these signs in scripture. You've seen the sign of Jonah, a man who went into the belly of a great fish for three days and was spit back up and alive again. Now one who is greater than Jonah is here. You saw the queen of the south who went to see Solomon and all his wisdom. She traveled so far just to sit and to learn from him. Now one greater than Solomon is here. And so let me tell you the light that is before you. You need to pay attention to the light that is before you. So picking up verse 33. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Again, these are basic lighting principles here. You want the light to illuminate the dark. In the first century, oil lamps were the common way of lighting a home. They were simple and they were efficient. They, they looked like this. This is, this is my oil lamp. This is from the time of Jesus. This is one that uh, would have been used, um, and, and it's the same one that's pictured there. That little top hole would have been filled with oil. A wick would have come out of the other end, and you could walk around. It was a portable lamp for you to go wherever you wanted to go, as long as you had oil and a wick. And the way that this would work is that you would light this lamp, and then if you were home, you wanted it to to light up as much of the room as you could, and so you would have a ledge built in your kind of one room uh, family area where everyone was at, and you would just put this lamp up on the ledge so that it would give the most light possible. Now, we, we don't really use lamps all that much anymore unless uh, the power goes out and then and then we do and we usually get a couple of opportunities a year to do that which is awesome I love it I love it so much so much but when you walk into a dark room what's the first thing you do you turn on the lights so that you can see where you're going and what's in front of you Jesus talks a lot about light. We've already seen him talk around light in the Gospel of Luke in uh, chapter 8, verse 16. He already said something similar to what we're reading here. He said, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Again, light is meant to illuminate. It's meant to bring clarity and perception and the ability to see the world around us rightly. So why would you light a lamp only to cover it? No, that's not what you would do. You want it to shine brightly so that it can light the path in the area of all around you. You light a lamp to better see what's in front of you. And so Jesus continues on. He says, you're not lighting this to hide it. Verse 33, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Jesus here is saying that your eye is the lamp that lights the entirety of who you are. Meaning what you see and what you're looking at and paying attention to is what you are inputting into your life. It's illuminating what you think about. It's illuminating who you are becoming by the things you are watching, the things you are reading, the things you are participating in. To put this another way, in a way we've talked around before, that where we stare, we steer. What we're looking at is what we gravitate towards in the same way of what we consume consumes us. And what we feed in our lives are the things that get fat. That's just how it it works. For those of you who watched the Super Bowl last weekend, I know too soon to bring it up. We're not going to talk about the game itself. We're going to talk about the commercials, okay? There was one commercial that was put out by Pluto TV. 
and you might have seen it. It began with a farmer in his truck going out to his field to check on his crops. And as he pulls in, we see endless rows of couch potatoes, right? Did you see this one? <laughs> Human potatoes, people consuming content. And while I laughed at like what they were showing and what they were explaining, I also found it amazing how honest this TV channel was being. Like they were not hiding that, hey, listen, if our product is working right, you are just going to plant yourself on the couch and you're just going to root there staring at our content and that means we win. That's what we're hoping for. Like this is victory for Pluto TV. And we can laugh at that and we can kind of poke fun at ourselves. But the sad reality is there's like too much truth to an image like that. Because how often have you been watching a show and that little reminder pops up in the corner as you've just finished it? And it's like, would you like to continue watching? And it's like doing that spinning countdown thing. And the person you're sitting with, your spouse, your roommate, the remote's in between you and neither one of you is moving. Like, I'm going to stop it. You're just looking at the other like, are you going to stop it or am I going to stop it? And then in your silence, you're both saying, we're going to keep watching, right? There's no judgment here, right? And it just keeps going. And, and maybe, maybe you've experienced the humiliation of when you've watched a certain amount of episodes in a row where the screen comes on and says, are you still watching, right? <laughs> Which is almost as if your TV is like shaming you, like you're still here. Like I don't even want to be here anymore. Like this is what I do. Like get out, go do something, move around. But if you think about what you are consuming, it's amazing that nowadays you don't really have to think about it much. Our music stations can pick the music for us through automated recommendations and playlists that will continue to play different songs, learning your preferences along the way until you have a perfectly curated list of music. Our streaming services create a recommendation list or an autoplay feature that will just decide what you are going to watch next. The algorithms of what you see on the internet, they are tracking you, learning you, selling you, and deciding for you what you will see and what you will not see. This is why on my feed, I don't get a lot of hair care ads, right? They know who they're dealing with. I don't need a comb. That's not my thing. And while these automated features can lead to discoveries of stories and shows, news and music, you may never have discovered on your own. It's so important to remember that the companies behind this technology, their hope is that you continue to mindlessly depend on what is placed in front of you for their profit, not for yours. They just want you plugged in. That's the important thing for them, that you're still listening, that you're still watching, that you're still going. They're not going like, is this good for them? That's not what they're thinking about. And this is why we need to pay attention to what we're paying attention to. See, Jesus is saying, your eye is the lamp of your body. What you take in shapes who you are and who you're becoming. And so how does he say this? He says, when your eye is healthy, and the word healthy here means sound, sincere, singular, focused. When you're healthy, when you're paying attention to the right things, what does it say? Your whole body is full of light. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. There's, there's actually a belief in the, the first century uh, Jewish people that if, if they said you have a healthy eye, that meant you were generous too, like you were a kind and generous person. So when your eye is healthy, when you're paying attention to the right things around you, your whole body is full of light. It radiates goodness. There's no place for mold to grow in the dark or hidden places to, to keep unhealthy secrets because it's lit up. But when it's bad, and here the word for bad is the same word that Pastor Ryan helped us understand last week when Jesus was talking to those around him and he called them an evil generation, a bad generation. It's the same word here. And the word means unsound, unstable, wicked, evil. When your eye is bad, your body is full of darkness. That's what Jesus is saying. So when your eye is sound, focused on light, it fills you with light. 
But when your eye is unsound, unfocused, taking in evil, it will fill you with darkness. So the question before us is, what are we consuming? What are we focusing on? What are we taking in? And what's taking us in? These are the things we need to be paying attention to. This is what Jesus is saying. Hey, look at me. Look at me. Verse 35. He says, therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. Be careful that when you are allowing the the light in your life, the things that you are allowing to light up your life, if those are dark, then it's just going to fill you with darkness. Be careful that you are not allowing things to shape you uh, that are not following in the way of Jesus. Pay attention to what you are consuming. Centuries before Jesus walked the earth, the prophet Isaiah warned against fixing our attention on the wrong things. He said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe. Uh, Woe is a word of of warning and encouragement to turn uh, from what is in front of you, the path that that you are currently on. Would you get off of that? Turn from those who call evil good and those who call good evil. And we live in a day where that gets real sloppy real fast. Or things that are celebrated that are contrary to the way of Jesus and seen as good. And like, hey, don't make such a big deal about that. It's not worth fighting for. You're, you're fine. It's, not a, it's, just, it's a little shade. It's a little shadow. You'll be fine. This is what happens, though, when we play in the dark for too long. Our eyes begin to adjust. And we lose our way. We settle for less. We take the, bath, the path of least resistance. And in turn, we lose ourselves in the process. Brett McCracken says it like this. He says, our world has more information, but less and less wisdom. More data, less clarity. More stimulation, less synthesis. More distraction, less stillness. More pontificating, less pondering. More opinion, less research. More speaking, less listening. More to look at, less to see. More amusements, less joy. There is more, but we are less. And what Jesus is reminding those who are listening is that we were made for so much more. So instead of playing in the shadows, instead of living in such a way that you're constantly looking over your shoulder wondering if you're going to be caught or allowing past mistakes to limit our ability to truly live and be present to those around us today, he's calling us, he's inviting us to step into the light. This is what Paul, the Apostle Paul, was reminding the church in Ephesus about. He was reminding them of the new way to be human that has been made possible by Jesus. In Ephesians 5, 8, Paul says, For at one time you were darkness. That's who you were. You were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Because of Jesus, you are now light. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Man, verse 9, pay attention to that one. What's the fruit of light? What's the fruit of walking in the light? You are going to experience all that is good and right and true. This is an incredible filter for us when we're taking things in, when we're listening to things, when we're, 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 we're binging a podcast or we're watching a TV show. Is this, is, this, is this good? Is this right? Is this true? Or am I just taking it in and, and letting it have whatever effect it's going to have on me? Verse 10, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anyone is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Now that that last sentence in verse 13, it sounds like Paul is just pointing out the obvious. When he's like, anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. You're like, well, thank you. When something is lit up, now you can see it. Yes. But there's something powerful and profound to what he's saying here. He's saying that anything that becomes visible is light. Meaning the things that we like to keep back, hide in the shadows, uh, we give those a power over us when we linger there. We're not able to show up in relationship when we're holding secrets from the person who's in front of us. 
We're not truly there. We're afraid of being found out. But when you expose those things to the light, you can show up open-handed to the people around you. This is who I am. There's no shade. There's no shadow. And I just want to say, that, that, that sounds amazing, but we will wrestle with this the rest of our life. The amount of times where I'm having a conversation with someone and I've just begun to recognize when the Lord's like, why are you shading this conversation the way you are? Why are you holding back from this person? Why are you trying to make yourself look better in this situation? Because I watched you. You did not nail it. You know? But we bring things to the light. So they become visible. And when we bring things to the light, we're allowing God to get to work on them. See, this is the beauty of the light. When we live in the light, we are, we're free. We don't have to wonder if we're telling the truth or are my lies going to collide in this moment or the things that I've been hiding, are they going to be exposed? Because you're, you're just free. You're just free to be who you are. There's no shade or shadow to the words we say or the things that we do. Again, we live with open hands before the Lord and before those around us. But again, the problem we have is, is sin. Sin pulls us into the shadows. It pulls us into the shade. And once we step into the dark, we can easily become lost. And what is worse, we can actually begin to like the dark. We can begin to feel comfortable there, feel safer there. When I was a youth pastor, we would go up to this camp every year. And when we were there, there was one night where we would play this game. Uh, and, and all the youth pastors looked forward to it. Where we would all, all the youth pastors would go and hide. Right? We would go and hide, and the kids had to come find us. And it, it got to this point where like, all the youth pastors were like, ultra competitive, of, like who was going to be the last person found. So like, one guy like, came with a full wetsuit so that he could hide underneath the dock and the lake. Right? Like, it, got, it, got, it got a little absurd. And so me and my buddy were like, you know what? We're, we know this one spot. There's this grove of trees right in the middle of all these cabins that no, everyone kind of walks around, but they don't see. So we're just going to climb these trees. The only problem was there wasn't a lot of branches. So we had to like, we're like bears going up it like as high as we can. And so I, I, I climbed up as high as I could. And I just hung onto that thing for dear life, like just holding still there. And kids would come close and they'd be like walking right under us. And I'm just like, don't sneeze. Don't, you know, don't drop anything, you know. And they're like looking around like, I don't, I don't think anyone's here. And like, I'm trying not to laugh because I'm like, I'm right here, you know. Uh, but I just hold on tight. And, and then I had this other realization that like, I'm not the only thing in this tree. There's other things living in this tree. Some of you know I have a deep fear of bats. Bats like trees, particularly this kind of tree. And so I'm hearing them click and whir all around me. And I'm just like, do I just let myself go at this point? Like, just call it a day. Like, I'm done, Lord. Take me. Uh, but I'm just like, no, I'm clinging because I'm like, I'm going to win this game. Now, why do I bring this up? Because I think this is what we do when we hide in the dark. We just we cling on for dear life. And this thing gets a hold on us and so that we never truly live. And what Jesus is saying is there's so much more life for you in the light, and yet you keep going back to the dark. You think it's safer there, but it is the worst place for you because it's limiting the way in which you can encounter the Lord and encounter those around you because you're just a shadow of who you really are because you're hiding this secret or you're, you're holding on to this mistake that you made in the past thinking that if this was known, no one would ever want to know me. And we allow the darkness to win time and time again. And that's why we have to remember, why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? And one of the most quoted verses, he makes it really clear. John 3, 16, what does he say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God sent Jesus that you could have life in him. And we often will stop at 316, but I love 17. Because it says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He came to rescue us and to redeem us. And whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. To Jesus is offering life. He's offering us a way forward to walk in the light. And as Jesus is speaking to this crowd that is around him, he's reminding them that light 
has come. And that light is found in him. This is why Jesus says in John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. There is life in the light. And Jesus has come to expose our faults, our failures, our flaws in order to free us, in order to restore us and to redeem us. But we have to keep our eyes fixed on him, allowing him to light our way, allowing his light to fill us. Psalm 119, 105 reminds us, it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I love this image, that, that the word of God is, is a lamp to our feet. That if we, we have this out in front of us, if we're paying attention to this, it's going to help to light the way, even when it gets tricky, even when it feels real dark. And sometimes in the darkness, like you've got your little light and that's all you've got, and so you're real close to it. This is how we should be with the word. It's a lamp and a light to our feet. The effect of truth in our life is that it brings light to that which once was dark. But the beauty of this is it, it's, it's not just for us. That this light that shines in our life, it doesn't just benefit us. It not only lights our path, but it, it illumines. When we are, we're shining for God's glory, we are going to light those around us. They're going to see the hope of Jesus in and through us. And when the darkness feels overwhelming to them, we will be a reflection of God's light to them. Offering hope. Jesus is the word. He is the light that illuminates the path of life. And there's no other path to life except through him. And so he summarizes this in verse 36. He says, if then your whole body is full of light. If you're paying attention to me, this is verse 36, chapter 11. If your whole body then is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. When we look to the light and allow Jesus' light to fill us, we will find life. And not only that, but our lives will begin to shine for God's glory. We'll radiate his goodness. And we hear this. And some of you in here, you've, you've, you've been carrying some things for a long time. You've been pushing some things back for a long time. Or you're in the midst of the mess of some things becoming exposed and you're feeling it. And you're going, that sounds great, but what does that look like? Because I don't know if that's really possible. What does it look like to allow Christ's light to shine on us and in us and through us? Well, it means that we look to him. It means we allow him to light our path daily, moment by moment. It means we're close enough to him for his light to shine on us and to guide our path. In his book, The, the Wisdom Pyramid, Brett McCracken helps to lay some guidelines for, for where we stare, how that affects where we steer. Uh, he, he lays some guidelines for the things that we consume that are consuming us and the things that we feed in our lives that we, we allow to get fat. And he gives some various categories. And I apologize. I tried to make this prettier and bigger and it just didn't work. And so some of you are like, I can't read that. I'm going to read it for you. All right. I'm going to help you. So he gives these categories. And he, his book is really targeting where we pull wisdom from. But I think there's some overlap into how we just live in general. What are the sources that we are pulling from in our life? And so he lays a foundation. He says, to be strong, you need to start from the bottom and work your way up. And so the very bottom level is scripture, that we allow God's word to guide us. That we're coming to that and we're allowing this to be uh, the, the litmus test. Or we're allowing it to be our plumb line for truth. That we're allowing this to be what is filling us and what we're, we're meditating upon. And then he gives this other line, and he says, the next thing up is the church. And when I first read that, I'm like, I can't say that to people. That feels really self-serving, right? Like, the next thing you need is this right here. This is, this is what you need. Uh, but the beauty of this and the reminder of this is in order to live this out, to embody what God is speaking and doing through you, 
to embody that, you need to live that in community. And that's the beauty of when we gather in this space. We're coming here commonly under the banner of Jesus saying we want to conform more to his image. And I've got some rough parts of my life that I think you can help me with. And I'm going to practice what does it mean to love my neighbor on you. And sometimes I'm going to do that really well and sometimes I'm not going to do that well. And sometimes I'm going to have to come into this room and there's going to be someone that I've got, I've got some beef with. And how am I going to handle that? I'm going to need to practice that in this room so that I'm not sitting through church the entire time distracted that that person's here. Can you believe they came? Don't they know this is my church? How dare they, right? You're not laughing because you're experiencing it right now, right? Like some of you are like, I'm not going to look at the person I'm mad at, but they are here. And how dare you? But this gives us a space to embody this. And then he talks around this idea of nature. Are we actually getting out? Are we unplugging ourselves? And just taking in God's creation. Now, some of you, that's like your love language. You're like, that's all I do. I love to get outside. Others of you are like, there's bugs, there's animals. I don't want any part of that. But I can enjoy it from my kitchen window. If I can see a sunset, I can recognize God's artistry in that. Books, what are the things that we're we're reading? And some of you, I know you're avid readers. Others of you are like, books? What are these books you speak of, right? (laughs) There's a really funny trend that's happening with books right now, that they're getting smaller and the chapters are getting shorter. And this is intentional because what publishers are recognizing is that we don't have the attention span that we used to. And so in order for people to feel like they're achieving more, chapters are getting shorter. So you can be like, I read three chapters today. And you're like, well, how long were those chapters? I mean, a page each, but I read all three of them, right? And it feels like a win. But what are the things that we're reading? What are the things we're listening to? I know there's a lot of audible books that we do. What's the content we're taking in? What are the podcasts that we're listening to? The teachers that we're listening to? What are the things we're we're ingesting? That, that That doesn't trump this, that it comes alongside this, but this needs to be the foundation. And then beauty. Where's the art that we're taking in? The the music, the the stories that we're hearing. Because story is so powerful. I mean, that's why we have these huge structures with massive screens, because we love to be entertained and see stories. And then the last thing, the the space that he reserves the the least amount of room for is internet and social media, right? And what's so funny is so often that's the one we're plugged into the most. That's the one that's shaping us because it's quick, it's easy, we don't have to think, and it just comes to us. It just shows up on my phone, it's there. I can just swipe and see so many things. We think it's just a little bit, but over time, that is shaping you. It's forming you. And so using this framework, what I want to encourage you to do is just a little exercise this week, okay? Just a few questions to think through. What, what are the, just kind of audit where you're spending your time and the other lamps and lights that you're looking at, okay? So just ask yourself these questions. Where, where am I spending the most time? Right, like, what, of, of those things, where, what's getting the most of me right now? You know, I, I don't know if you're like me. Our phones, they can keep track of, like, the app usage that we have. I turn that off because I don't want to see it, right? Like, I will just readily admit that. I'm like, I don't, I don't want the accountability. Thank you. But, but where are you spending the most of your time? What, what are areas that, that maybe you need to increase? And I'm, I'm just not, I've not been in community for far too long. I've just been living an individualistic life and just trying to do this all on my own and it's not working. So I've got to find a space to get involved with people, to, to come into contact with other people. Maybe it's, I just, I, I, the Bible's hard to read, so I just find it's like the last thing I want to do. When I have five minutes to myself, that feels really hard. And if that's you, I understand that because the Bible can be hard to read at times. There are certain spaces that feel like, what is going on here? That's why I encourage you to get some really easy study tools. A good study Bible goes a long way because it can give you some context and some tools to help make sense of some things as you're, as you're kind of learning the rhythm of that. What are areas that I need to decrease? Right? What's an area, man, I've, I've just been leaning too much into. Maybe this is something that I just need to, to lessen. What are... What's an area or an area that I, I need to take a break from entirely? Like, I just need to turn this off. I, this is taking me really bad spaces. And finally, what area or areas do I need help with? Right? And this is a question we don't like because it assumes you can't do it on your own. But there's certain things and certain patterns that we have that we get locked into. And if we're our own accountability system, we're pretty gracious with ourselves. Right? 
Like, well, it was a long day. It's fine. We'll start tomorrow, right? And so you need to pull other people into your life to be like, man, I just, there's some things that I've been looking at that I know I shouldn't be looking at. And I just need to talk to somebody else about it because nothing's going to change unless I do something drastically different. So, so walk through these questions this week. Think through this. What, what are the things that you're paying attention to? Pay attention to them because they're forming you. They're shaping you. If you find yourself angry all the time after you get off the internet, well, ask yourself, what did I just look at? Did I just read all the comments of people who are going after people and I just like feel frustrated right now because I pulled out my popcorn and just it was like, oh, this is great. That's not good for your soul. What are you paying attention to? You need to pay attention to it. And what I want you also to hear from me as I'm saying this is the prescription isn't, you know what, you should only be reading the Bible. That is the only thing you should be doing. But what Jesus is reminding us of here is to see the world in light of him and in the light of him. Meaning that's the first filter that we look at everything through. C.S. Lewis said it so well when he says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. When we look at the light and we allow the light to fill us, when we let that be first and foremost in our lives, it becomes the way in which we see all the world around us. When we fix our eyes on the light, we see the world in light of Jesus. We see the world in light of his resurrection. We see the world in light of the path he paved for us. We see the world in light of the abundant life he offers. There is life in the light. So many of the stories that are being told today don't even realize what they are searching for, what they are looking for is satisfaction in Jesus. Why are we so uh, captivated by stories of heroes that sacrifice themselves for everybody else? Because we're all looking for a savior to rescue and redeem us. This is why uh, Marvel's uh, Endgame was so powerful and why everyone was like, Iron Man is my hero because he gave up his life. And it, well. Because we want someone who's willing to sacrifice for us. The story of Iron Man, he died, and he stayed dead. Unless they bring him back, which they're talking about doing because they can, because it's movies and it's fiction. But anyway, uh, story of the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus came that we may have life in him. And all the things we couldn't overcome on our own, all the battles, all the struggles, all the, the demons that we wrestle with in the dark, all of those things that we're holding on tight to that are, are shaping us, informing us, he broke us free of all those. And when he conquered those, he took on our death that our sin uh, deserved. And he died in our place. And the beauty is, uh, when he died, he did not stay in the tomb, but he rose again, offering life once and for all, for all who believe in him, for all who confess his name. There is life in Jesus. And so he says, I am the light. Look at me. Follow me. Step into the light, and you will live. For there is life in the light. But we continue to play in the shadows. And the question is, are we going to allow the light of Christ to shine in all areas of our lives so that we may live for him fully and freely? So John 3, that passage we looked at earlier, it talks around why Jesus came to save, but it also makes it really clear in verse 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. Jesus has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The choice is before us. Life in the light or death in the dark. This is what Jesus is speaking to. This is what he's offering to us, to step into the light. And experience life in him. 
See, Al Johnson had lived with his secret for a long time, that he had robbed that bank, that he had lied to his wife and just compounded so many different things. Until one day he got a a random piece of mail. And it was a a gospel tract that he was ready to throw away, but it was God's plan for salvation. And so kind of just like, oh, whatever. He starts reading through it and he gets to a line that says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And in this moment, he stopped and he paused and he realized that there was more for him than he had been experiencing. That all the lies and the ways in which he had stepped into the dark was consuming him and he didn't want to live there anymore and so he stepped into the light and life of Jesus. And as he said yes to Jesus, he began to allow the light of Jesus to expose more and more areas of darkness in his life until finally he felt compelled to go down to the police station years after he had gotten away with the crime and confess that in fact he had robbed the bank. Now what's so funny is even in telling that story, sometimes we hear that and we're like, I didn't need to do that. But he did. He did because God had convicted and he needed to expose what was going on in his life. And so he came before them and said, I I committed this crime. And what, what came out of this story was they took it up, they looked at it, statute of limitations, all sorts of things. They're like, we, we can't press any charges. But man, the news crew wanted to tell his story over and over again. And so suddenly Al Johnson was proclaiming the gospel to news outlets across the United States, sharing the hope that is found in Jesus and the ability that we all have to step into the light and life that he offers all because he took the darkness that was in his life and exposed it to the light of Jesus and allowed that to begin to radiate through him, brightly reflecting the glory of God to every person he got to share his story with. See, and this is the choice before us. Life in the light or death in the dark. And some of you in this room, I know you have played in the shadows for way too long. You've allowed lies to just cripple you. So afraid of being exposed. You've allowed past actions uh, that you just want to keep hidden so you're never really fully known. But it is time to stop and step into the light. To allow his light to shine on you and experience true freedom in Christ. And so as we close this morning, I want to I offer up two, two prayers. Because it'd be really easy to just say, hey, some of you might have some things that you've been holding back. And you could walk out of this room and not tell anybody. You could walk out of this room and pretend like, I don't have to do anything. That was just a feeling I was having. I don't want to waste the opportunity. God is inviting you to step into the light and experience light in him. And so maybe this morning, you just need to confess and say, Lord, I've been choosing darkness rather than light. And I need you. And so I'm going to ask, if that's you, if you just need to come to him, I'm not going to ask you to stand, say anything. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand because I want to pray alongside you. If you just need to, Lord, I just need to confess there's some things in the dark that I just need to give over to you. If that's you, just raise your hand right where you're at. Romans 10.9 reminds us, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You're free. And those things that you're confessing, our good and faithful and just Savior forgives you and he sees you and he loves you 
and he has come to save you and to rescue you and to invite you into so much more. And so if you've got your hand raised, I'm just going to pray this simple prayer. Maybe this helps to guide you. It just says this, Jesus, you have come to seek and to save. And I have chosen the darkness rather than the light. Today I step into your light, trusting that in you is life. So I confess my need for you. Expose the darkness of my life and bring me into your light. Lord, for those who've raised their hands, may they know the depth of your love for them. The things that they are releasing to you, would you, would you take them? Would they walk from this room washed, clean, and sanctified in you? Would you protect their minds not to return again and say that wasn't real? You still have to pay for what you've done. You're still the same person. Lord, would you, would you speak to them in powerful ways, reminding them of who they are in you, that they are free, they are forgiven, that they are a new creation. Lord, go before us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we move into a time of worship, and I'm going to invite the worship team out, I want to leave us with this one last thought. Colossians 1.13 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He's taken us from the kingdom of darkness, and if we've said yes to Jesus, he transfers us over into the kingdom of light, his kingdom. And we can know that, and we can live that, and yet we can still allow the shadows to take hold of our heart in so many different ways. And so I want to encourage you in just this moment, just to pause, to stop, and, and to pray, Lord, would you just expose anything in me that I need to give to you? I put a, a sample prayer there that might help you to think through some things just to confess to him. Uh, Lord, I know you have delivered me from darkness and transferred me into your kingdom, but I have allowed darkness in my life through Maybe it's the things you're watching. There's some things that you're paying way too much attention to that are dark and damaging. Maybe there's some things that you're listening to, some voices that you've elevated in your life. Maybe it is simply dwelling on past mistakes. Maybe there's some lies that you're hanging on to that you know you just need to come clean on. So Lord, forgive me and turn my eyes back to you. We're going to leave this on the screen. Life is in the light. And Jesus is the light of life. So now as we enter into this time of worship and prayer, there's a couple things available to you. Communion table, which is a reminder of Jesus' body and his blood that was given for us, that in him we have life. And so you can take that at your own pace when you're ready just to go before him and say, Lord, I say yes to you all over again. There's also gonna be people around the room that if you need prayer, if you just need someone to pray over, you don't even have to tell them what's going on in your life. You can just say, I just need you to pray. And we'd love to pray over you. If you just need to say, I just need to, to confess that I have stepped into the dark. It, you don't have to go into detail and you just need someone to, to speak truth over you. We'll have people available to you. But spend this time allowing God to speak to you, exposing the ways that we are allowing dark into our lives. And so, Father, we pray no one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Our eyes are the lamp of our body. And when our eyes are healthy, our whole bodies are full of light, but when it's bad, our bodies are full of darkness. Therefore, keep us in the light and expose the darkness in our hearts, Lord. Uproot it. May our whole bodies be full of light, having no part of the dark, so that we may shine bright as lamps for your glory. We pray all of this in Jesus' name.
Father, you have given us the gift of life. Uh, And Lord, would we step into it with you, not apart from you, pursuing things that pull us into the dark, but chasing your light, living in the midst of your light, that we may shine for your glory. God, you are good. And in you there is freedom and forgiveness, and we thank you. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we close this morning, I um, just want to encourage you, if you need prayer, we'll be around, and we'd love to pray alongside you. Uh, men, it is not too late. Sign up for men's retreat. Get on it. Uh, and if you'd like to hear some powerful stories of what God is doing uh, across the globe. Tomorrow night, Mac and Ruth will be in the fellowship hall sharing how God is using them and what he's up to. Um, They'd love to have you join them tomorrow night. Uh, But as we leave from here, let me just leave you with this verse. 1 John 1. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In Jesus, by Jesus, through Jesus, we are forgiven and free. May you walk in his grace this week and experience his peace. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow night.